Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, we'll do stanzas uh, two and four. Two and four. Oh, how when at length the fullness of the appointed time was come, he the word was born of woman, left for us his father's home. chapter 7 um, and uh, the Dan remember in chapter 2 we had Daniel's or sorry Nebuchadnezzar's dream um, we have chapter 7 which is Daniel's dream which parallels this is the lions then and this is Daniel's dream Daniel's dream parallels Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 7 we're not going to look at the rest of the, the book um, from chapter 8 on in detail simply because we do not have time and it is one of the more complex uh, apocalyptic prophetic sections of the Bible. Um, not that I am scared of it, but for being a Bible overview class, it's just too much, right? But um, I do encourage you to read it and to use what we've talked about so far in the book of Daniel to uh, help you understand it. I will also go ahead and say now that, um, and I happened to grab this Bible because my other Bible is um, at home. I left it at home by accident, but um, 
I will also say this is one place where I would recommend the Lutheran Study Bible or a, a Lutheran Study Bible. There are a couple versions out there I can tell you about. Um, the Lutheran Study Bible that I normally use is the one that um, is from CPH that's being still being published right now. Uh, I think it started being published in the late 2000s sometime. I know I got the older version when I was in confirmation, so it had to be after that that this came out. But um, anyway, the footnotes in this are pretty good. And especially, um, it was actually my Hebrew professor, Dr. Andrew Steinman uh, from Concordia, Chicago, who wrote the CPH commentary on Daniel, the most recent one. And he did the footnotes for this section, I believe, and also has some helpful charts and diagrams in the book of Daniel in this, this, this <coughs> Bible, the Lutheran Study Bible, it's maroon. This is the big version, you can get ones that are a little more compact, but anyway, the footnotes and, and charts in here are very helpful in understanding something like Daniel, which is apocalyptic and very confusing, frankly, so. Um, but we use the clearer parts of scripture to interpret the less clear parts, and um, it's not insurmountable, but anyhow, that's that's my thing on that. So, all right, um, but let's pick back up in a story that you probably know. This is one of those um, Sunday school stories which, which people tend to know, um, which is good because it, it is from kind of a later part of the Old Testament. I've I've mentioned before, I think that it's kind of weird when we teach Sunday school, we kind of stop, it seems, um, with like David, right? Uh, but but here we do get this later part um, of the Old Testament where Daniel and his friends are in captivity and uh, they're under the rule of Babylon. Now here, uh, Daniel in chapter six, if you remember what happened last time with the handwriting on the walls, in chapter 5, the uh, Darius the Mede has taken over for Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian, right? So now uh, with the fiery furnace, we had Nebuchadnezzar, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel and the lions then, very similar story in many ways, but now under Darius the Mede, right? And that's following that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, right? That the Medes and the Persians would take over. Uh, followed by eventually the Romans, and then there would be a, a major crumbling. Now, um, I'm just going to start reading a little bit here, and maybe just we'll point out a few things. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one. <clears throat> so one difference here between the the chapter 3 and chapter uh, 6 Right? And you, you can't see here, by the way, the Bible does this a lot. I'd probably be remiss to not point this out. That in chapters 2 through 7, which we talked about as kind of a block because they're written in Aramaic, right? You have um, chapter 2 and 7, you have dreams. Right? You have Nebuchadnezzar's here and Daniel's here. In chapters 3 and 6, you have um, the miraculous salvation from certain death stories, right? So you have, um, we'll just call them salvation stories, I guess. Um, you have the fiery furnace here and the lion's den here. And then in four and five, you have these warnings. First to Nebuchadnezzar, and then to Belteshazzar, uh, Bel Belteshazzar, no, yeah, Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, yeah. Not Belteshazzar, which is dangerous. So, what you can see here is um, this is uh, called this is it's kind of a poetic device 
right? So you have A and A prime, B and B prime, C and C prime, and they, uh, each chapter in this block of two through seven parallels the one opposite in the, in the chart. Um, this is called, there's a name for this, and I started talking about it, and now I can't even think of the name of what, what the rhetorical device is called. Anyway, Luke does this all the time. In, in his gospel. Uh, so you can you can kind of start to look for these patterns in places, but um, this is one of those things that it, it makes the scriptures actually easier to remember, right? And, and to get into your head. Because if you can kind of remember, okay, these chapters each parallel each other, um, and these stories parallel each other, then uh, you can kind of know the order they go in and recall what's going on in each of them. And it, it also tends to point toward um, what one of the central messages of the text is, right? Because normally whatever comes kind of in the center here is one of the big messages of the book. And I think you can see that in these warnings, right? Because um, what happens with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar. Jeez, Belshazzar. Belshazzar. I, I keep trying to add a T in there. Belshazzar. Okay. Um, Belshazzar is Daniel. Belshazzar is the Nebuchadnezzar's son. Okay, anyhow. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is born and goes crazy and is restored because he repents. Belshazzar is not. And so the... He's warned and he doesn't repent and he's destroyed, right? So you get these kind of two contrasting warnings right in the center uh, that are part of the main message of the book, which is uh, repent and be saved, right? That's part. That's really one of the main messages of all these stories in this this block in the book of Daniel. Okay. Anyway, but I just wanted to point that out that you have. So back to chapter six. Okay. So chapter six is um, the final salvation story in this block. Um, a difference here between the previous story is that Daniel has been raised up to this point as a higher power within the country, right? So before, in the beginning of the book, the, Daniel and his friends, they were living there and they were called to be wise men for the king, but they were not um, as high up in the kingdom. Right, they uh, were considered to be lesser in the kingdom, and now Daniel has been raised up um, above as one of the presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was with him. Right, and so you can see here that this Daniel also parallels very nicely with the Joseph stories in Genesis. Right, that Joseph is persecuted but then raised up and brings salvation to people. So. Uh, we get kind of a repetition of that. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, right? So Darius is uh, fond of Daniel. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground of complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, because, but they could not find, uh, but they could find no ground or complaint for any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. This is messianic, right? What is, this happens all the time with Jesus and the Pharisees. Right? They, they try and find fault in him, and they can't. So ultimately, they have to make something up. Right? And, um, and, they, and they conspire against him. And this is what happens in, the, in Daniel. Right? So these men said, uh, we shall not find any ground or complaint against this Daniel unless we find any connection with the law of his God. <clears throat> then these presidents of satraps came to agreement and said to the king, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the, perfect, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes any petition or any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast out into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. All right, so a couple things going on here. Um, one is the, again, very parallel to the life of Jesus. The people who are standing against Daniel are trying to entrap him 
with a kind of a civil law, right? Um, and so this is what the, the there's this interplay between religion and and government, right? Where in Jesus' case, they the the Jews in charge, the Sanhedrin, try to entrap Jesus, and they do entrap Jesus kind of based on one of their laws, but have the Romans enforce it, right? Here, the government, the pagan government, um, wants to entrap Daniel, and so they make a religious law that they can try him by, right? So very similar types of using kind of the interplay of religion and government to entrap uh, the, the person they're trying to persecute, right? And... This happens today too, right? Like, so just like think of like gay weddings or whatever. Like whenever like Christians, um, uh, people try and hire Christians to help with their gay wedding and they refuse, and then there's these lawsuits that ensue. Like weddings are religious, right? Like um, they always have been, and th this is one one place where I say like, you know. Um, the we can get into long discussions about the separation of church and state, but my my basic point I want to say is that like Christians should be worried and concerned with what the laws are on the books and what the government uh, is doing. Right when when we think about separation of church and state, it should not be this like strict, strict, strict separation where. Christians kind of live in their own little world and, and the government lives in its own little world and there's no interplay between the two because that's simply unavoidable, right? It, it's just simply, you can't live life that way, right? Like, we're not um, like the Amish where we can just kind of go off and do our own thing and no one will bother us, um, which, and that's not even true with the Amish. If you look at the history of the Amish, they've had to fight legal battles to get this certain level of freedom that they have and they have to have certain a certain lifestyle in place to even make that possible which we simply don't believe in or have and so uh, we have to deal with such things um, but the, the government does make religious claims right like when the government says that um, boys can marry boys right that is a religious claim Right? Because that has to do with the nature of man and the nature of creation. And and we have to deal with that. Right? And if we're not going to submit to that, then uh, we have to be ready to deal with what the consequences may be in the future. Right? So, um, anyway. Right? So there, there is this interplay. The other thing that's interesting here is that the, um, the people trying to entrap uh, Daniel, and this is uh, very kind of similar with the Sanhedrin and Pilate, is that they use rhetoric with the king to um, persuade him to do what they want. And um, like in the, in the Sanhedrin's case with Pilate, they appeal to his de dedication to Caesar, right? And they're like, well, you're, you're a Roman governor, right? Like, you're, you've got to be a friend of Caesar's. And if you want to be a friend of Caesar's, you got to do this thing for us. In the same way here, the presidents and the satraps and the counselors tell the king, um, and they, they're a little bit more sly here. They're a little less like, um, it's a little less pressure and a little more they're trying to woo him, right? They're like, um, almost, they're, they're, they're complimenting him. Um, they're saying, oh, you, King, you're so, King, oh, King Darius, live forever. You know, you're so great. Don't you want people to only pray to you, right? And it's this appeal, it's a, it's devilish, right? It's, it's very similar to what the devil does to Jesus. He's like, you know, oh, look at, look at all the power you can have. Look at the kingdoms of the earth, all right? We're going to talk about that a little bit today in the sermon, how people want worldly glory. And, um. They're trying to appeal to that temptation of Darius, and they successfully do, to get him to sign this injunction saying, uh, um, any man that does not make petition 
uh, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Okay. <coughs> when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knee three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Um, so a couple things here. One, uh, it's notable here that, I'm trying to think of which thing I want to start with. I, I think we'll start here. Notable here that he does this openly, right? Where he, um, he, he basically makes no effort to hide it, right? And the, the text points that out. He kept his window open and he faced toward Jerusalem as he had always done. He, they knew exactly, he knew exactly what he was doing, right? And they knew what he was doing. And he didn't make any effort to like hide it. And what I wanna say about that is that there is a time to be bold like that. And there's also a time I think to be more clever than that. And we see both examples in the Bible, right? So uh, we see, for instance, uh, when David is being persecuted by Saul, David uses certain tactics of deception to stay alive so that he can be king one day, right? And he's actually commanded to by God um, to like hide for a time, right? And the early church and, and churches under persecution have done this for centuries too, like underground churches, right? And there is a time and place for that in order to survive and in order for the gospel to continue and to spread. There's also a time uh, to be ready to be martyred, right? And obviously we get the greatest example of that in the greatest martyr, which is Jesus. Right, where he does not make an attempt to, like his disciples want to protect him. Right, like Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier when, like they're ready to, you know, rumble <laughs> with the soldiers, right, and, and try and protect Jesus. But um, Jesus goes peacefully because it's his father's will. And Daniel also knows it's his father's will here that he be martyred. Um, and that there's going to be a greater outcome from this, right? He has a vision from the Lord. And uh, so the early church had this rule that I think we always kind of have to keep in balance, right? That we do not seek martyrdom, but we're ready for martyrdom, right? And you have to kind of keep those things in balance. And you have to kind of pray and read the scriptures and figure out um, by discernment and wisdom of God what the time is right is a time to uh <clears throat> deceive in a noble way and 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 hide and 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 be um wise as serpents but innocent as doves or is it a time to simply be open right and be bold and whatever consequences come they come right so th these are the things we have to keep about but for Dan daniel it's a time to uh just pray with his window open and I, I do like that it says uh, he prayed three times a day. Um, this is very traditionally a Christian devotional practice. If you look in the uh, at-home prayer at the top of at-home prayer, it should have this verse in there. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Psalm 55, 17. Uh, evening, morning, and noon, right? Three times a day. Um, in Luther's small catechism, he gives a morning prayer, an evening prayer, and a mealtime prayer. And uh, so I think this is like, I don't want to say the bare minimum, because it's obviously not the bare minimum, but um, this is <coughs> at least kind of like the, the standard for Christian prayer, is that we pray... And it doesn't have to be long or complex, but then we'd say a prayer in the morning, a prayer in the evening, and, and a prayer at mealtime, right? Or in the afternoon. And uh, Daniel does that. The Psalms talk about that. Um, it's kind of been traditional Christian practice for a long time. To, and then the, the monks upped it to seven times a day, right? But we don't have to be monks. <laughs> Maybe we can be like Daniel. Okay. Um, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. They came near and said to the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction? 
and so on and so forth. The king answered, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pay no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but make his petition, makes his petition three times a day. Um, let me say something about the law of the Medes and Persians here. Um, the, this actually came up in Bible study over at Oxford last week, the, where we were in the Gospel of Mark, and we had the story about Herod um, beheading John the Baptist. And when that happens, he, has, he makes this promise to Herodias' daughter and says, whatever you want, I'll give, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And um, she asks for that. Her mother tells her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. And then he, he ha it says that he has to do it because he said so. And um, one of the members there asked this question last week about, like, this happens, this seems to happen in the Bible a couple different times where someone says something kind of stupid and then it's like they they have to hold to it like comes back and, and it's like and his question was like why can't they just change their mind right which in when in our society um that is something that happens all the time right like we, people say stuff and then they they back out and there's basically like little no consequences and what i said to him was that i think it's interesting in our society right because we have a very 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 like legally minded society like if if you want something to be absolutely sure and certain and someone not to back out of something like you have to have contracts and lawyers involved and even then with contracts and lawyers, if you get a, if you pay enough money for a good enough lawyer, they'll find a way out of it, <laughs> right? Like, um, so it's it's kind of interesting the society we live in, in that like that kind of um, cultural pressure of saying something or signing something and holding to it doesn't seem to be as weighty as it does in the ancient world. Right? In the ancient world, in the biblical world, it seems to be very weighty if you say something, and especially here if you sign something. right? And that's kind of the point of according to the law of the Medes and Persians, Darius is Mede, right? Um, and I, I think there's some cultural significance there, too, that I don't re recall or remember. But um, that basically it's like this is set in stone, right? Like there's no way this is changing, right? So um, something to think about. I mean – I don't know what the application of that is particularly, but interesting cultural difference. And then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. I did, I did just think of an application of that, actually. Um, I think one thing that should show us is that when God promises something in the Bible, he means it too, right? Like if At least if people promise something and they, they can carry it out and mean it, um, then certainly whatever God says in the scriptures means something. All right. And Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Um, the, there's a biblical theme here of sealing. Which kind of goes to what I was just saying, that when something is sealed or anointed, um, it is marked as sure and certain. And we get this language of the seal um, with the uh, the ancient idea of a signet, right? Like, and the other idea of the sealing or the signet is is not. One, that it's sure and certain and, and it's, like, permanent. But two, you also uh, see who the author or who's in charge is, right? Because the, the ancient idea of a signet here is that when you send an important letter, 
you take a wax seal and s with your signet ring, a king would have like a ring that would be a signet with a signet on it, a sign, and he'd seal it in the wax, right? And then you knew it was from that that person, that king or governor or whatever, right? Um, so Paul picks up on this language, which is used here about the uh, sealing of the lion's den with uh, the stone, which is uh, what Paul picks up on it is that this is what happens in baptism. And this is, by the way, why I always include the anointing of oil in the baptism, um, because this is kind of the symbol of that, is that that's the anointing or the sealing. And you hear this in the liturgy um, that you've been marked, right, or sealed, or uh, signeted, right, with Christ the crucified. You've been marked as one redeemed by Christ crucified. And you also get this with the, uh, not only with the oil, but with the sign of the cross, right? The sign of the cross, the signet of the cross. That whenever um, in the baptismal liturgy, right, it's receive the sign of the cross, both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. That's like God stamping his signet ring on the person, right? So pretty cool uh, symbolism there. Um, but that's what's going on with with Darius and the tomb here. The other thing, uh, I just called it a tomb, kind of gave it away. The other thing, the den, um, that is definitely being foreshadowed here is uh, Jesus' tomb and resurrection, right? Because, I mean, how do you how do you not see this? A stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den and the king sealed it, right? Um, that... This is a sure and certain death, right, for Daniel. And this is this is his tomb, right? He's going to death. And and the stones roll over top. There's no way he can push it out of the way. Right? But what what of course is gonna happen? Same thing that happened with Jesus, right? He's not gonna die. Right? He's gonna be raised. And the tomb the stone's gonna be rolled away. And uh, it's it's all very much resurrection language here. Then at the break of day, the king rose. Oh, um, missed this part. Uh, the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Okay, so the king, King Darius here, uh, he recognizes. It's very similar to Nebuchadnezzar, right? Where Nebuchadnezzar has these moments where he seems somewhat faithful, right? And he at least recognizes the power of Daniel and the authority of Daniel. Now, maybe he isn't a Christian, right? But he recognizes something there. And he can't, he, he feels terrible about what he's done, right? Which is good. Um, and this is what we call a conscience, right? That a good, a good conscience will, will bother someone like this whenever they've sinned. They can't sleep, they can't eat, right? Um, that's the sign of a, of a conscience at work. Right, or a sign of a constant work. And you can see that, we don't need to go into this too much, but you can see there the connection of body and soul too, right? That something wrong in his soul affects his bodily life. Then at the break of the day, the king arose and went with haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared, Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the den of the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, and I have done no harm. And the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in God. And the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. And then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell, all the earth peace be multiplied to you, and I make a decree that in all my world the many people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues who works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has served Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel 
prospered during the reign of Darius and during the uh, reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, so this is where we get a lot more parallels to the fiery furnace story. Um, so first of all, it's an angel that comes and shuts the, the mouth of the lions. And um, this is, I mean, kind of up to interpretation for sure. But one could make the argument that based on the story of the fiery furnace being, in my opinion, pretty clearly the pre-incarnate Christ, that when Daniel says, yeah, God sent uh, his angel to come and shut the lion's mouth, <coughs> that we have another instance of the pre-incarnate Christ coming to save Daniel, just like he did the friends. Um, now, it could just be an angel. Maybe it's not the pre-incarnate Christ, but... Um, just, just for your food for thought. Okay. Um, also here, we have uh, a parallel in that um, it's a little different than the fire furnace. In the fire furnace, Nebuchadnezzar was angry and he ordered the men to heat the furnace seven times hotter. And because of that, some of the servants of the, the king were destroyed in the fire. Here... Darius is much more explicit in that after the fact, he sees the power of God. And then in rage toward the people who trapped him into this uh, situation, he orders them to be thrown into the lion's den. Uh, with their wives and children, right? Which, you could take that two ways. Um, I think... What one way would be to say that was wrong and he shouldn't have done that, right? Um, he shouldn't have punished those wives and children that way. Um, I, would, I don't think it's wrong to say that. I think it's a right punishment that, that the people who entrapped him and, and, and forced him to make this awful, idolatrous law were punished with the um, death penalty. I don't think that's... Uh, wrong <laughs> actually um according to kind of the rest of the old testament and how god deals with people um, whenever they're idolatrous but um but that that kind of rubs against modern ears i guess but um the other way to take it would be that um kind of from a cultural perspective at least this is totally normal punishment for so, so people who have gone against a, a king of the time, yeah. right? And um, this is this is nothing as bad as what the Babylonians had done to the Israelites as well, right? So a good a, a, a parallel place to look in the Bible for this would be Psalm one thirty seven, which is an imprecatory psalm that the Israelites pray against the Babylonians in captivity. And they pray that God would dash the Babylonians' children against the rocks. And that's in the Bible. And it's in a prayer to God. That's a psalm, right? So, um, it's not that that... It, so, first of all, in that psalm, it's left up to God whether or not he's actually going to do that. Right? And it's not wicked for the Israelites to express their anger in the injustices that are done to them. But... One thing to keep in mind is that um, it, they're simply asking for God to repay exactly what was done to them, right? So there is a fairness in the in these kinds of things, right? Now it's it is of course very hard and difficult to think about like children being punished for the sins of their fathers, and God in His mercy, um, I think. You know, that's not how God deals with people, thank the Lord. But um, from a kind of human and cultural perspective here, this isn't all that weird. We see that several times in the Bible, the Bible don't we? Where the person doing, the person who has sinned, that they've taken everything they own. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and God commands the destruction, like of the Edomites. Uh, I think it's the Edomites, right? Or is it? Um, who is it? 
Anyway, um, there's a couple places in this, like, where God commands the destruction from the Israelite army of, like, an entire city, like, everybody. They just wipe them out um, because they're so wicked. Same with Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, Sodom and Gomorrah, there was, there was children there. And we kind of have to deal with that. I think, like, where modern American Christianity, like, just doesn't talk about stuff like this. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, like, when kids go to college, their atheist professor is going to bring these things up. Right? So it's like, maybe we should talk about this and what justice is, and maybe that would be a little bit better for us. So, anyway. All right. Um, shoot, I'm not going to get to chapter 7, am I? Uh, the final thing we can talk about here is that, again, I think we have an instance where it's hard to say where Darius' faith was at this point, right? Because he, he doesn't say, like, if he was truly converted, like full out converted, you would think he would say, stop praying to me, stop praying to Bell." Like, uh, cast, uh, like, let's break down the altars of Baal. Um, let's <clears throat> stop worshiping Molech, you know, and only worship the true Lord of God. And, by the way, let's go rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, right? Like, he doesn't do that. He, at, by, any, by any means, right? Um, his kingdom goes on and... Um, it's not until Cyrus that they get to return to Jerusalem. And when Cyrus grants it, it's just like granting a petition. It's not like Cyrus is that incredibly faithful either. However, this decree he makes is, it sounds very faithful, right? For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues, he works signs and wonders in heaven and earth. He who saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So he confesses that God is the true God. But I think, again, we have to remember this polytheism that exists in the, in the culture. That they have multiple gods. And I think basically what's happening here is that Darius is allowing Daniel's God to be one of the gods that's worshipped. Right? And he says, oh yeah, he's a really powerful God too, you know. Like he, um, and, and maybe he'll be the, the, a God who lasts forever. <laughs> but um, it's this kind of halfway repentance, right? And I, it, it's worth thinking about, um, I think I mentioned this last week too, with, or a couple weeks ago with Nebuchadnezzar is that you can kind of see that in society today where people will recognize like, oh, Christianity is not bad, but like, it's like the I'm spiritual but not religious, you know? Like, yeah, you know, Christianity is is fine. Like, God is a God, but you know, there's also, Muslims are good people too. That, that type of thing. Um, and we always have to remind ourselves that, and I think it, it can be difficult because, especially in a more secular and secular society, we, we probably have friends that are that way, or family members. And we have to remember, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Like, there's no other name among men by which man may be saved. And uh, ultimately, we don't know what exactly happened to Darius. I, I doubt he died a Christian. But um, it doesn't matter if someone like this would be parallel in some ways to someone who like doesn't come to church and isn't really a faithful Christian, but kind of like respects Christianity. So they like give a big donation to a church or something like that. And in their somewhere in their thinking, that's like good enough, right? It's kind of a works righteousness type of thing, right? Um, where it's like, oh, you know, I'm a good person, I'm a good guy, I respect God, I just don't really want to, like, practice Christianity, right? And um, at the end of the day, that's not good enough. Like, faith without works is dead. And true faith uh, results in uh, a life that is fully given to Christ. And 
that that is what it is. So anyway, we'll end there. Any final questions or comments on on uh, Darius and the lines? Then we'll talk about uh, Daniel's vision next week, and maybe we'll start the next uh, book as well. I don't know. I can't remember what we're doing next. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the good gifts that you have given us, and especially for sending Christ to be our King over heaven and earth. Uh, we pray that we might worship him above all other things. Help us to love and trust in you above all other things. Help us to not fall into idolatry, but help us to be bold in our faith in Christ. For Christ crucified is the power to save for all people. We pray that you would bless our worship today together and open the minds and hearts of all here. And we thank you for all the wonderful gifts that you continue to give. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.